I'm Peter Carruthers. Welcome to this short presentation about mind mapping and what you can do with it. I've been a fan of mind mapping since my last year in school back in 1975. Hell, more than 40 years ago. That was long before computers. I wanted to go to medical school, but my end of year marks in Standard 9 weren't good enough. I ended the year with five D grades, that's D for Delta, and an F. And with those kinds of marks, I'd have been lucky to find a job in a bank. Anyway, at the end of Standard 9, I read a book by Tony Buzan introducing the concept of mind mapping, visualizing information and notes, rather than writing words on paper in the way that we normally do. Back then, the only way to do mind mapping was with a pencil and paper. And his book illustrated a couple of ways to use a mind map to compress information. I did two things. As the year started, I quickly compressed each textbook onto a single map on one page and used that as a guideline for my studies for the whole year. I'll show you how to do that shortly. This left me enough time to do the other thing, which was buy every single old exam paper I could lay my hands on, identify the common questions, and then make sure that I had maps for every single one of those, detailed maps. So when I reached each exam room at the end of the year and read the exam paper, before I did anything else, I quickly drew a map of my answers to each question based on the images I was carrying in my head. After that, all I needed to worry about was writing as fast as I could to turn those maps back into the written word in a format that the examiner wanted to see. I ended the year with five B grades and a D for Latin. B in Bravo, not Delta. And the Latin mark was the best mark I'd ever done for the language, despite five years of intensive training by Mr. Wesley. And yes, I made it to medical school. Thanks for asking. But I've since learned to be careful what I wish for. It turned out that the dream of medical school wasn't quite the same as the reality. And so I left after two years and coincidentally went to work for a bank. Let's cross over to the computer industry because mind mapping software has been around for a long time. I've worked with most of the programs over the years, including probably the most popular one, Mind Manager. But I've settled on a free open source product called Freeplane. That's the software that you're seeing in front of you on the screen. I like it because it works on Apple Mac and Windows and Linux, which means if I ship a map out to my clients, they can read it on virtually anything. Rather than teach you how to use the software, I'm going to share how I use it in my business and my studies. Information is typically given to us in books, non-fiction books, textbooks, acts of parliament. And even if you're looking at software, the structure of the information is hidden in the menus. All of this information has a structure. There's a table of contents in a book that leads us into individual chapters and that leads us into the subheadings in each chapter and every subheading has another subheading and so we go. The number of layers of information can be very distracting and once we've worked through the material it's our job to extract the essence, the important bits, and regurgitate those when needed, or find them quickly when needed. Nowadays, when I start reading a non-fiction book or something that I want to study, something that I want to master, the first thing I do is put that structure into a mind map. So if you look at this book called The Sedona Method, for instance, the, the book was a book that I read when I was having a whole range of personal issues, um, battling with... Uh, a bunch of emotional challenges and battling depression and, and the book basically talked about the nine emotions that we experience apathy is right at the bottom and that's utter depression and we go through grief fear lust anger and all the way up to an acceptance of what is and a peace about it all if that were enough to remember that would be pretty darn good but what really got to me in the book was the fact that we use a different batch of words to describe each of these individual emotions so for example and this is where the concept of a map comes in. We can look at the concept of basic emotions, then we can analyze the emotions without getting lost in the detail, and then we can look at what the words we might use would be for each of these. So let's go with fear for the moment. And let me just make this entire map a little smaller. And you can see there's a lot of words over here, but 
Words that we would use to describe fear would be evasive or hysterical or paralyzed or shaky or shy or threatened. And they all in some way describe some facet of fear. And what we've done is we've compressed into effectively a very small space, a complete book. If we get past that and we have a look at, for example, releasing questions, the kind of questions you might ask in the sense of, how do I really feel about this? Okay, so how do I feel about this? Could I allow this feeling to exist, which you don't really have an option because you have to. It's there. Can I let it go? Would I let it go? Am I so attached to it? And do I really want to const constantly feel grumpy about my wife? And then some mechanisms for letting it go. And what you're seeing here effectively is in a single line, I've compressed the whole book. In three lines, I've compressed the key concepts. In nine lines, I've compressed all of the basic emotions. And finally, if we look at any one of these, you'll find a whole batch of words describing it. So I've compressed the whole thing, one of the most complex pieces of information any of us will ever bump into, is an Act of Parliament. And I'd like to show you how the South African Companies Act of 2008 looks in a different format. Let's start with it in its regular live format. So. What we have here is 197 pages of Government Act. This is the body. So what we've got is an index covering the key issues, and it's broken into parts and chapters and individual sections down on the left-hand side. And as we scroll down and we get deeper and deeper into the detail, you see there's no end of it. So if we have a look at this, for example, you try and read that and make sense of it, and wow, you're doing better than I am. I've always battled at this particular level. And the difficulty is trying to find something, trying to find a definition, as well as trying to work out what fits there. What I'm going to do is take this particular block of information and drop it here into a company's act. And if you look at that page, what, what you see is at the very top layer is company's act. Then we've got the individual chapters worked down, the interpretation, purpose and application, the formation, administration and dissolution of companies. And I'll follow the bold line for the moment. And in order to make this work, I'm going to have to keep moving to the right. So Companies Act, Chapter 2, is broken up into Part A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And Part A is the reservation and registration of companies. So if you've ever worked at when somebody quotes some number in an act, as in Chapter 2, Part A, now you know how they arrived at that. We go to Part B, incorporation and legal status of the company. And over here, what we've got is the right to incorporate a company, registration of a company, but we're going to follow the memorandum of incorporation section. And we dig deeper in over there, and here are the individual components there. Each provision of a company's memorandum of incorporation, and it goes even deeper, must be consistent with this act and is void to the extent that it contravenes or is inconsistent with this act. And suddenly you have a flow from the beginning of the act to this particular point. You can see it in that context. The rules of the company, a rule contemplated in subsection 3, that would be that section. A rule contemplated in subsection 3 must be consistent with this act. They, they kind of repeat stuff a lot. Takes effect on a date that is the later of. And so we go. So what we've done effectively is instead of 197 pages and a file which is big as in three or four meg we've compressed this down into effectively about 15 lines and then as we go deeper and deeper into the detail away we go we're compressing the data to make it easy to reach easier to understand and when we come to software my biggest challenge business-wise was coming to grips with a software product called infusionsoft we have a saying in the industry about people and software and that is when you get into trouble, RTFM, read the flipping manual. And I've censored that a little bit because the techies use a different word. Infusionsoft, I have three books on the subject, 600 pages each. And they go into the detail so fast that it's easy to get lost. What I now do with the software product before I start learning it, I look at the structure, which is always based on the menus and the items in the menus. And the structure of Infusionsoft, when you arrive at it, basically consists of a MyNav section, a CRM section of contacts, companies, opportunities, a marketing section, which is a campaign builder. Each of these is broken down into individual sections. And the most important thing about any piece of software is, is one, knowing what you can do with it. And in going through the menu structure, you learn that. But also remembering where the hell they hit the bits. This allows me to do that as well. 
that's the end of the section on compressing data into information. I hope you agree that visual information is a lot easier to work with than linear information. So moving linear stuff, words, paragraphs, chapters, into a visual format where you can see how they tie together makes it easier to understand. It makes it more accessible and it uses a heck of a lot less space when you're trying to save stuff. What I'd like to do is go back to our example of the Companies Act and show you how easy it is to transfer information. So I'm going to take the Companies Act, I'm going to copy it, Control C or Command C, depending on what you're used to using, and I'm going to drop that into a simple text editor. This could be Microsoft Word. I'm using a very simple text editor called Cot, C-O-T, in the Mac. And let me paste that quickly. And that is the entire act, 335 lines of it compressed into one line. And this isn't the, the complete act because I only expanded for purposes of illustration just one segment, which was the memorandum of incorporation. And that alone, if you start scrolling through it, consists of some way in, in the order of a couple of hundred lines. We've taken it out of that visual format, structural format, and we've dropped it into a, an editor. Why don't we just do that back? Take anything, and I'm going to just use this example again, so I'm going to clean my, my clipboard by selecting all, select all, and then I'm going to copy it, not as rich text, I'm just going to copy it in its basic format. I'm going to go to compressing data with information and paste it again. That tells me where it's coming from, and if I go here, you'll recognize the format. It's exactly the same data, but structured. So what you have is the ability to cross over very simply between textual information and this structural information. As I get older, I find the small effort taken to compress the data in all of the books and all of the software and all of the systems I use into this picturesque format makes it much easier to remember and to find later. One of the reasons I enjoy using Freeplane is that it's not too tempting to get lost in making the pictures pretty or making it so visual that the message gets lost. But sometimes you might want to do that. A few years ago, a partner and myself wrote a system to quickly put a website on the front page of Google. It uses Google AdWords, the uh, pay-per-click system. But the problem with that is when you research Google to find appropriate keywords or search phrases, you're buried in them, hundreds, sometimes thousands of phrases that you can use. And we looked at a mechanism to easily make the results obvious by coloring them. And that's what I want to show you now. The scale of Freeplane is almost infinite. Um, I've had something like 500,000 individual nodes in a system. It's manageable because the, the ultimate mass data is right at the end of a long series of nodes. So let's have a look at this AdWords mind map. It was a campaign diagnostic map, map, uh, map that we set up. And effectively what we did is we took the information that Google gave us in this particular case about heat pumps. And th this is a map that's about five or six years old and I've worked with it many times. So it's, it's a little smaller. In fact, it's a lot smaller than it used to be. When we pumped the data into the mind map, we gave it color. The longer a key phrase is in Google, the more likely it is to be useful. So anything in black is short. Anything with three or more words is longer and possibly more effective. And now with Google becoming far more granular, it's probably five or six words and longer that you want to mark. A key phrase that is indicated in green is something that contains a buy signal. Somebody saying price of or searching for where to buy a heat pump. And finally, key phrases in, in red contain an antibody signal, and that would be a word like job or vacancy, the, indicating that the person wasn't actually searching for, in this case, heat pumps, but was searching for a job in the heat pump industry. So that's the legend. And let's look at, at the results. Once again, I'm going to have to make this a whole chunk smaller. But if I scroll simply from the top to the bottom, you'll see that there's a whole range of stuff over here. And the longer the word, the better in terms of somebody searching to buy. So we go from there. That was, that was Google's rendition of anything with the phrase heat pump in it. Heat pumps is plural, and in fact it's a different word. 
uh, at least as far as Google is concerned, and then we have that batch over there as well. ESCOM rebates, they were offering rebates at the time, and in black, ESCOM Solar, it's too short. Underfloor heating, part of the same campaign, and so on. I won't go into this summary and, and, and the other stuff that we did. We did that outside of the, heat, uh, of the, the map and dropped it back in. When we go on to the concept of gathering data, using it for research, having a map in the corner of your desktop as a place just to drop information is just astoundingly useful. I've used it often. I use it virtually every day in terms of gathering data. And I'll use a quick example over here. This is some research I did on sales and marketing ideas a, a while back. On the one side of my screen, I have Google. And on the left-hand side of my screen, I have a mind map. In fact, let me show you what's there because there's a whole pile of stuff over there. So these are all items that I've simply copied from Google, things like get endorsed by a local celebrity, get published on niche blogs, make a list of all your competitors, 42 marketing ideas, that's a whole batch more. So in terms of research, th this is truly and really an awesome mechanism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open that up, call it new research, and let's search Google for marketing ideas. I can do one of two things. Let's look at 22 low budget marketing ideas for small businesses. What I can do is I can either copy the entire page across, like Zo, if I want to dig into it later on, or I can do a quick browse and say, wow, that looks pretty impressive, and grab that, or grab two of them at the same time and simply drag them across, like so. So you've got the ability to cut and paste virtually anything or the content of virtually anything into a mind map and then effectively browse through and work out what it is that you want to write about. It, it's superb for gathering information at this level. And I know there are probably better ideas more suited to this, but in terms of a robust tool that you can use for a whole range of different things, mind mapping is truly wonderful. And finally, let's talk about creating structure, actually creating something rather than borrowing from somewhere else and reinterpreting that information. I'll illustrate with two simple mechanisms that I've, two simple maps that I've used to build products that have basically paid my way for the last 15 years. The Crash Proof Your Business presentation, when it started out, looked a little bit like this. So what I'm going to do is once again, I'll take this and copy it into a new map, strip out the bottom half or the top half and drop it there and strip out the bottom half and drop it there, make it a little bit bigger. And let's go to the front. So this was the flow of a three hour session on stage. There was an introduction. There was a discussion of my story, all of the various people that are involved in your business, which meant I never got lost during the presentation. These titles each matched the slide. But when it came time to write the book, it was simply a matter of taking each segment and writing out that segment. It, it made writing the book intensely easy because I always knew what to do next. There was never getting lost. So as a structure behind doing something important, whether it's a build your website project or a systematize your business project, this truly is awesome. And it is massively scalable. So if I go back here and I look at the Ernst schedule, which was a 48 week program, those are the, the months. Um, we, we delivered it over 48 weeks, which is why it's a week. But in essence, the, each of these is a, is a session. So have a look at month one. Those are the things that we covered. If I go to an overview of income models, for example, the second session basically covers affiliate schemes and why selling a course is better than selling a book, uh, freelancing. And then we had a question and answer session and a short Skype video. This was the basis of a 12 month project. It started here on a piece of free software. And I cannot give you a better acc accolade than that. So in conclusion, this particular mental tool, this, this mind mapping thing, is the most powerful way to manipulate information that we have available to us. Whether you're using it in a pencil and paper format or whether you're using software, it's faster and easier to learn stuff and develop stuff than any other way I know. I'm sharing this because most folk don't see mind mapping as anything other than a toy. I regard it as the most important tool in my arsenal.